So when we, we left off, we left off with that exercise about um, our posture reflecting our mood. And we even have it in our language. If we're upright in the world, we're weighed down by the world. It's quite difficult for how our posture, if it doesn't match what we're saying, as we've just done. When you're upright and you go, I'm really happy, great. When you're down here and you say, really happy, you're going, no. Oh. And, th- and it's, you don't convince yourself. Be quite literally, your body isn't convinced either. It's because when we just drop our shoulders even slightly forward, we're actually increasing our stress. And quite literally what we're doing is we are halving the amount of oxygen that goes into our lungs because we're actually squishing our guts up here. Our diaphragm is not able to draw in the breath correctly. We only have half the amount of oxygen going into our brain. Now, if that's the case, then less oxygen, not, that's not enough oxygen, it's a stressor. Off we go around the houses because the body's going, oh, hang on a minute, I haven't got enough to, I haven't got enough resources. Off we go. You do that for long enough, you'll actually start to get very tight here. You may even have a back problem, even more stresses. This 20 pound bowling ball here, okay, 15 to 20, depending on who you are, obviously. In my case, it's 20. <laughs> Maybe a little more. Um, <laughs> shh, wasn't that funny? Um, 20 pound bowling ball, when you're upright, it's very easy for your body to maintain standing. As we've already said, that standing is actually one of those very complicated things for the body to do is there's so many muscles to operate just to stop us from falling over. Centre of gravity is about here, runs through, quite easy for us to be upright. We just drop our head this way, suddenly our centre of gravity is shifted over here, the weight starts to go on our lower back and also on our feet. We're starting to quite literally increase the amount of tension and stress on our physical being. It starts to become a problem. You do that, you're having just the same effect as you may as well have a lion behind you because you're also not running either. Yeah, makes sense? Or a zebra on your neck. Yeah. Or a zebra on your neck, yes. <laughs> yes, I forgot about the stress for the giraffe. <laughs> okay, on. <laughs> okay, so, does that make sense? So we've then, we can tie up quite easily that you don't actually have to be either running or fighting. Now, I didn't mention fighting earlier on, is that in the same way that blood flow goes to your thigh muscles when we're running or when we're in the, the flight mode, if we're in the fight mode, where does it go? Oh, I'm going to have a scrap. Okay, it goes upwards to our arms, into our chest. We start to inc- we take in a deep breath. We have it in our in our the way we talk about the language is. Oh, I'm, yes, I'm ready for a fight. Punch up. Quite literally, this is what happens. Okay, so the body's very clever. It, it it's fairly certain of what it needs to do. Is that if it can't run away, then it's going to make a sense. Uh, what also happens is that in essence, our pain receptors start to shut down very quickly particularly when it's more so when to do with uh, fight, but also with flight. That if, if you get bitten a few times, the, the zebra's going, I still don't care whether my leg's falling off, I still will try and get away, because it's about survival. Missing a leg at this particular point in time, not really important, because I need to live. I need to be, because if you live, then you want to procreate. But Hence where sex is involved again. It's interesting that Wayne, uh, from this same conference, has been involved with... Yeah. That in a in a fight situation, the kick and the nudges doesn't necessarily bring nope. the bloke to his knees, but it will ten minutes later. Yeah. That's very interesting. Isn't it? There are there are various accounts of people having major spinal injuries in car crashes and everything else, and they've walked away from the event, and then the following morning, then they can't get up because they're actually paralysed. Which, again, you don't have thought makes too much difference, but at that particular time, when the body is saying, no, survival is key here. Walking? No, nope, I don't care. Which is sort of a bit crazy, because this also points out that the body is capable of actually walking and running with, in essence, half its spine heart, um, falling off. But the body's rerouted. It's gone, no, no, got to run away. Yes, but you're missing a spinal cord. Don't care. <laughs> the flies in the face of evidence. Which has got an awful lot to do with fascia again. Is that this is sort of my what I do for a living to a certain degree? Is that the muscles we're told and how they function? In other words, you have a bicep and a tricep and such things. They are separated. We think of them as separated to a certain degree, and yet they're all in these bags. This bag of fascia, and your bag of fascia is like your skin. It is a single continuity. So if you have a bit missing in fascial terms, it doesn't care. It, can, it goes everywhere, so it will be able to adapt. 
the body is, in, is capable of, you know, the idea of the Incredible Hulk. When you're angry, you can have huge amounts of strength. There are lots of documents of this kind of thing where you have, you know, mothers ripping off car doors to save their baby in the case of a, a case of stress because it doesn't worry about whether it survives or, in fact, uh, whether it's going to injure itself. A lot, an awful lot of why we are, are unable to do so much is because we are afraid. We're fearful of well, what happens if. Whereas in the case of fight or flight, at that particular point in time, we don't care. Flight is not the same as fear, from a biochemical point of view. Fear is, to a certain degree, is, is, is um, thinking. The body isn't thinking much, or rather, not in the normal way. What does happen in the case of the zebra story is when it's running away, its memory gets really, really good. And this is something that dopamine does. Is one of the thing, key things that dopamine does do is it helps you lay down memory. It is the key memory hormone to a certain degree. Imagine you're a zebra. Grassy plain again. It's being chased by a zebra. Uh, by a zebra? No, by a lion. Now, let's say for the first time, this is the first time it's ever happened. It's got its genetic memory to a certain degree. It knows that it needs to run and that lions are dangerous. Running away is also a good idea. Fighting only is a last resort because zebras against lions don't often, zebras don't often come out well because it doesn't have pointy claws or pointy teeth. So apart from its blood pressure going up and also its pain, being fed with painkillers, dopamine is pretty good at being a painkiller too, it's also telling the brain, OK, if we get out of this, if we get out of this, please, please remember how we did it. Because if it happens again, I need to know how we got away. Because I don't fancy doing this again. And this, in essence, what happens with dopamine is that under short-term stress, our memory, we learn really quickly. And this is where the stress response can be our friend too. Short-term stress can be very good for us, particularly if we're in a learning situation. Um, if you're doing exams and other such things, if you can limit your, the amount of stress you have to short bursts, you can learn things very, very quickly. When you have to do something, I have to learn this, you can get very good at learning. I managed to learn French in about three months because I had to. And yet I'd spent years trying to be taught languages at school and I could never do it. And yet somebody bungled me on a ship with four or five hundred Frenchmen and I was the only English person. They could have told me that before I got the job, but it was either learn French or get ignored for a long time. It's amazing how fast you can learn a language when you have to. And this is something else, that when you have to do something, when there is a need, not want, but need to do something, the body is very clever at adapting. Okay? So stress can be your friend. Short-term stress, dopamine in short bursts, is really good for your memory. Yeah? Too much of it, mm, not so good. Fight or flight, in real terms, is all about short bursts, 15 minutes roughly. It alters between species, but it's reckoned about 15 minutes. You're OK. Any longer than that, there are bills to be paid later on. In the Western world, we're in debt a lot, which is a nice reflection of where we are generally, I think. Yeah? So what actually goes on biochemically for the zebra, and in fact humans, is in essence the same response. In your brain, part of your brain called the hypothalamus, hypothalamus it releases something called corticotropin-releasing hormone, CRH. This then triggers the pituitary gland, another little thing in your brain, to then release corticotropin. Strange that. Corticotropin releasing hormone then releases corticotropin, does what it says on the tin. And through a series of biochemical steps that has a list of chemicals this long, in an essence triggers your adrenal glands to release adrenaline. At the same time, your body also releases a series of glucocorticoids, which are a type of steroid hormone. Don't worry about that. The word glucocorticoids is going to be used quite a bit. It's a series of hormones... Think of them as steroids, 
makes athletes run faster. Not a bad um, analogy to a certain degree. But they have many functions. But in the case of stress, this is what we're talking about. Most of us know about adrenaline. We know adrenaline makes you run faster, makes you go faster. Fair enough. This process happens in seconds, possibly even a split second. Because if the lion is uh, behind you, if your hormones are going, uh, excuse me, could you um, possibly supply blood to the legs, please, if you wouldn't mind? I'm afraid you're stuffed. It's like, move now. Okay, and we do. It's very good at that. Glucocorticoids, on the other hand, take a little longer to have its effect. Now, the corticotropin was actually also the first brain hormone to be inferred in 1955, but also the last to be discovered, as far as we know. Yeah, happy with that so far? Two things happen. CRH, corticotropin, suppresses the appetite. Okay? At this point in time, the zebra is not bothered about whether it's digesting its grass at this point in time. Digestion, no. It literally shuts down the stomach. It says, okay, I don't need to be producing any energy, uh, major energy con consuming um, issues in the body. One of the biggest energy consuming things for the body to do is actually produce acids and bicarbonates for your stomach to break down food. Acid is very, you know, the hydrochloric acid, and it also needs the protective bicarbonates to protect the stomach. Okay, very energetically hungry. Body's going, nah, -uh. we need all the energy we can get to run away. It also, in essence, slows down peristalsis, which is the moving the poo around, really. Okay, your digestive processes slow down. In severe cases of fright, it evacuates the lower um, bowel. That's almost not, that's a completely automatic response. It's not necessarily a fight or flight response either. <coughs> Again, a bit tricky. However, from our point of view, our parasympathetic system, our digestion repair system, shuts down. Ish. But it's active in different ways. <coughs> but from our point of view, at this particular context, digestion repair, no. We don't care. Glucocorticoids, on the other hand, they increase our appetite. So at the same time as we're being told to suppress our appetite, there is also another chemical hurtling through our body, or rather taking its time in our body, that's telling us to increase our appetite. Now, one of them takes seconds to happen. OK, stop digesting, we need to run. The other one, for about 15 minutes, sometimes even hours later, the effect of glucocorticoids tells our body to start eating. There's a reason for this. Glucocorticoids really don't start working until a minimum of 15 minutes, which is interesting because 15 minutes is about how long the zebra's got the max before it runs out of adrenaline and the ability to carry on running from the lion at full pelt. So really it's a case of assuming the zebra has escaped, then the glucocorticoids are really important. If the zebra hasn't escaped, then actually it doesn't really matter. OK? Glucocorticoids do a particular thing to your appetite. They tell your body to actually, I want sugars or things with full of fat and easy access energy. So it's telling your appetite to do something different than eat grass. It's telling the zebra, actually, you know what? We've just escaped from that lion. I've just depleted all my energy. And I need to replace it really quickly and as fast as possible because there could be another lion around the corner in 10 minutes' time. So actually, grass is going to take way too long for me to break down. Too much chlorophyll, too many of the hard breakdown proteins. What I need is sugars. Quickly. So therefore, it goes to berries. Sugars. Easy. This is what happens. And this happens in humans, too. When we are stressed, our body is being told... After the adrenaline rush we get, oh dear me, I've also got the munchies. And I don't want munchies for a healthy apple, and I also don't particularly want the munchies for, you know, a, a good salad. What I actually really want is a piece of cake. Yeah. If that keeps going, I still want more cake. However, fortunately, we have a bit of a response to that. 
as does the zebra. Once it's replaced what it needs, the fat cells, once they get nice and full, they release a hormone called leptin, which I mentioned before. And they tell the brain, OK, switch off those glucocorticoids now, go back to normal eating, thank you very much. So the zebra goes from eating berries to then eating grass again, because we're all replaced, and then if a, zebra, if a lion comes back around again, off it trots. Yeah? Make sense? Now, when it comes to humans, we have something rather annoying. Is that One is we don't have a lion that chases us, and so therefore we don't run away physically. We physically do not get up and run. So what we have is we have a stress response that's saying, you need to run, and we're not. We are ignoring that response. So we've got plenty of adrenaline floating around, and one of the key things about what also happens in the fight-or-flight response is that to get that energy to produce that blood flow, to increase all that, the body literally needs to mobilise all those reserves of energy, all those sugars. It needs to convert it into energy very quickly. So cholesterol gets released. Woohoo! Yes, cholesterol is your friend. Cholesterol gets released. It is the job to herd, in essence, those fats into sugars and go, OK, right, get some energy because we need to run away now. Very good. So when you're stressed, your cholesterol levels rise because cholesterol is doing its job because that's one of the key things that cholesterol does. However, if we're sitting at a computer and we're not being chased by a lion, but simply by the rent man, the mortgage man, the bank manager, wives, husbands, whatever it may be, we're not making use of it's called metabolic demand. We're not making use of all these instructions. We're sitting about and not making use of our thigh muscles. We want to run, but we're not. So quite a, there is all this energy pent up in our bodies. So then we start to get feeling stressed. We know what it feels like. So therefore we're more likely to get angry quicker. We're more likely to be short because quite literally we get red in the face. Our blood pressure's gone up. We're red and we're... Our temperature starts to raise. But we're not doing anything about it. We are letting it float around. Yeah? But the thing is we're also being told we need to eat. Because those glucocorticoids are building up. It's gone past 15 minutes. We haven't used up the adrenaline. We haven't used up all this energy. So we're not burning off the fat that we want. But we're also being told we need to eat more. We're being told by our brain, I really fancy sugar. But actually you don't really want it because you haven't used any, anything up. So then we have a problem. So then some nitwit tells us we need to go on a diet. Okay, oh yes, you need to go on a low-fat diet, low-cholesterol diet, low-sugar diet, whatever it may be, yeah? Unfortunately, if you don't happen to like dieting, that's stressful. Hmm. Somebody gives you a salad. Well, the thing is, your brain's saying, I want cake. The thing is, a cake versus salad. And I want salad, I want cake. I'm stressed about that because somebody's telling me I should have salad because I'm putting on too much weight. <clears throat> but I'm wanting cake. Ah, oh, yes, but you're not allowed to have it. You've got to have salad. OK, I'll eat me salad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're stressed about eating a salad. And guess what happens if you, don't eat, if you eat things that your body doesn't want? You put on weight. Because when the body's in a stressful state, if it doesn't confirm in the same way as if what you're saying does not confirm with what your body is saying... You get stressed, you have a problem. The same thing with food. So ostensibly, you could eat a salad, and if you don't happen to like salad and you don't want salad, your body's stressed about it, so therefore you start to put on weight. Even though the, technically, there's hardly any weight in there. Well, the body actually converts it because it's trying to convert it into fat. However, if you eat the food you want, and you're pleased about it, you get a dopamine response. Mm, I feel happy about myself. Admittedly short term in this particular case. But the body's more likely to be less stressed because you're having what you want. And so therefore, your body doesn't start to hold it as fat. And so, so, quite often, you will start to actually lose weight. Which is a little bit strange. It's quite contrary. And in fact, there is loads of evidence to suggest that those people that are on low-fat diets actually gain more weight than those people that are put on a saturated fat diet. Yeah? Because it's actually stressful for the body. In most cultures, fat is prized above everything in terms of a foodstuff. You go Bushmilk Kalahari, they'll go, five a day? 
must be joking. I'll have some of that, you know, lion fat, thanks very much. Because it was hard one. I had to run away for a bit and then managed to get him, yeah? Fat and protein your body needs. It is a foodstuff packed with nutrients and the body can convert it any way which it wants, yeah? Sugar, on the other hand, gets converted into fat. So what happens with sugar? Fat does not get converted into fat by the body. doesn't happen. Yeah? Sugar gets converted into fat, and this is where we have a problem. The whole thing about carbs and proteins and fats. Yeah? With me on that so far? Okay. Can I just ask? Yes. Um, so what we're essentially saying is that how you feel about things, mm. state of mind, whether it's yep. causing you stress or not causing you stress affects... Yes, absolutely. Your relationship with food is key. And this is where we get things like bulimia or anorexia because the relationship is the problem, not actually what you're physically eating. So, but we did say that um, eating fat doesn't convert into fat, but eating yeah. sugar does convert yes. into stored sugar. But are, we, are you saying that if you're happy and you're eating sugar, yes. that that won't happen? Um, sort of yes and no. Dep- again, it's everything in moderation to a certain degree. If you stuff yourself with sugar, yes, you are going to put on fat. On fat. But the problem is, is the case of the relationship with the food in the first place is half the problem. Is because the way your body deals with food is very different. Is that in a survival sort of mode, your body is if uh, in, your body wants to hold on to stuff if it's threatened. In other words. If it's been chased by a lion, it is threatened, and in that particular case, it's about survival and needing to run away, and everything else doesn't matter. If you're in a famine situation, um, uh, mothers will, um, if they're pregnant, they will miscarry, because it's no longer a safe place to bring up a baby, so therefore it will get rid of something that it knows is not going to survive or doesn't stand a very good chance to survive. In the case of things like um, uh, stresses about food, I can't remember which way around this goes, is it something to do with the body actually is um, wanting to hold on to stored energy because if it knows it's going to be stressed, in other words, there's a lion going to be chasing it, it needs to hold on to as much energy as it can. So if it's got available sugars, it's going to be replacing the energy because the lion's chasing after you. In humans, we're not actually doing that. We're actually just keeping consuming those berries because we're being told we need it to replace the energy that we've lost or apparently lost by being chased. But we're not running so we're not burning up the energy. So the body's actually still in this stress, stressful state, and it's just doing what it's being told because it believes that it will use up those stores. But we're not. Does that make sense? Have I explained that? Uh, yeah? Well, what keeps running through my mind at the yes. moment is that in a, in a natural environment, yes. we would be getting sugars through complex yeah. um, sources. Yes. Today we're getting sugars from yeah. uh, processed sources, so we're getting pure sugars. Yes. Um, nine times out of ten, whether it's in yeah. the form of grains or, yeah. or or not. Yeah. Because in essence, the, you have whole, either whole grains or whole sugars, whatever they may be, even in fruit and such like. Uh, and in its natural state. That there are two things. One is that the liver quite literally has to break down these things. So it takes a certain amount of energy to break them down and convert them to whatever we need them. And ultimately, from the blood's point of view, it needs to convert it so that it becomes, in essence, glucose, so that we have a glucose level in our blood. Um, there is a, um, an argument, and again, this is, it's an ongoing one, and some people will agree and disagree with it. And I make a joke because I, one of the the lectures do is is eat less fruit and consume more lard. Uh, um, But it's not far from the truth is that according to certain people is that our body doesn't have to try hard to break down glucose. Yeah? Because it's glucose that we're consuming, glucose in our blood, there's not much of a hop, skip and a jump before we have to do that. It doesn't impact on the liver and the liver is one of the key things in charge of energy. If we have a healthy liver, we usually got plenty, plenty of energy. When it comes to something like, say, fructose, is that fructose apparently puts such a strain on the liver in terms of the something operating at 70 to 80 percent, according to some sources, is the liver has got to really work hard to do something with fructose. And if it's stressed, it's saying, you know what, I can't be bothered. What it does is it converts the fructose into fat because it says, and it's something ridiculous. Like for every hundred grams of fructose you consume, is it 40 to 60 grams of it becomes fat? 
whereas in glucose terms, it's actually it's something like less than 4% of glucose you consume gets converted into fat. So it does matter the type of sugar you're consuming, but not necessarily just because it's refined is it necessarily bad. I'd be far more worried about fake sugars than actual real sugar. But this idea of, the idea of consuming loads of fruit is a little bit barking, is that the only animal, well not the only one I'm sure, but the animal you can think of that consumes loads of fruit is a bear in autumn. And he does it for a damn good reason. Is he goes from eating fish, which is lots of proteins and fats, and doesn't really eat fruit at any other point in time, but come hibernation time, where it needs to have lots of stored fat to overwinter, then it switches from having fish and um, uh, those kind of things to consuming vast amounts of fruit. And because the fruit gets converted into sugar and it puts on, it sometimes doubles its weight, so that it gets converted into fat and then goes into its little um, hibernation cave and then uses that stored energy for hibernation purposes. And then when it wakes up again, it's all oh, right, okay, liver kicks into a different mode and says, okay, I fancy having lots of um, fish again, thank you very much. So there are uses, and I would say that the same is true. If we, again, this is the argument for macrobiotic diets and eating in season, is that generally speaking, the, the, the um, spring and summer fruits are, tend to be berries, and or, which is got plenty of vitamin C and there's something about I can't remember this is more your field in this in this case Di I think is that there's something to do with vitamin C and the interaction of the types of fruit sugars that are in berries differ from um, autumnal type fruits and I don't know what it is but it's if we actually ate the things that we're supposed to eat rather than eating fruit all year round there may actually also be a difference as well because our body is seasonal as well but I, I'm not too clear on that but there are there, the body does handle sugars differently, but just because it's refined doesn't necessarily make it bad. The quantities of sugar we consume, ostensibly way too much, is ridiculous. We just wouldn't come across them in the natural world at that sort of level. That, does that sort of answer your question? I have a question. Okay. Okay.